Hi folks, uh, Dan Folkman. I'm here with the uh, program this evening. We're going to be talking Phones on. Is it sounding okay? We're doing a sound check here now for the uh, Fair Voting Maps 101 educational session. We're in Wauwatos. We're in actually on Sherman Way and North Avenue at the uh, <coughs> Washington Public Library. And uh, we're about 10 minutes away from the start of the program. We have some illustrious members of the community here. Chris Rockwood just walked into the room. And we're looking forward to a very uh, educational meeting. There is a number of media people here covering this event. Uh, public television is here. <laughs> okay, I think um, our equipment is looking pretty good. And um, let me see if I can just talk to a couple of people while we're. we're I'm so pleased to have all of you here. My name is Sachin Chetta, and I'm the director of the Fair Elections Project. Woo! Such excitement. So let me do a little bit of housekeeping first. Uh, the program tonight is I'm going to do a little bit of intro. Then Shantae Nelson from Wisconsin Voices is going to do a little bit of gerrymandering 101, introduction to map rigging and gerrymandering. And then Senator Schultz and Senator Cullen are going to talk for a while, and then we're all going to take questions at the end. Okay? We have an hour. Now uh, the library and close till eight. So some of us might stay a little past seven. Right? All right, that's good. Uh, you have a number of documents in front of you. I want to draw your attention to this postcard. This postcard is an opportunity for you to have your voice heard by telling the state representative on the back that you want a hearing on this bill, which we're going to talk about later. If you want to sign the postcard, you just write your name and zip code and you turn it in at the table, it's already stamped, okay? Now, if you're not gonna fill the postcard out and you're not gonna mail it in, don't take it with you because these stamps cost money. So turn the postcard in blank and it'll get reused somewhere else. We also have two other things, back sheet here that says calling your legislators to take action. We're gonna go over that in more detail project and contributions. Uh, I want to acknowledge a few people who are in the room uh, first and foremost, let me recognize County Supervisor David Sartori from the southeast part of Milwaukee County. Uh, you clap once, you're going to clap a second time. You can stand, 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 you can stand a long time. Stand a long time. <laughs> I've known David a long time. <laughs> Supervisor Sartori was the lead sponsor of the legislation on the Milwaukee County Board, calling on the state legislature to implement a nonpartisan redistricting process. He is one of our champions. Thank you very much, Supervisor Sartori. <laughs> Very well done. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that uh, our Milwaukee City Treasurer, former State Senator Spencer Coggs is here, long been a progressive champion. Thank you very much for being here. Are there any other elected officials in the room that I should acknowledge? Former Wauwatosa Alderman Greg Waltz, there you go. He's not even elected anymore, but I'll acknowledge him. Uh, I want to thank all of the members of the Fair Maps Coalition. There are 10 organizations, I'm not going to name all of them, uh, including Citizen Action and OFA, uh, Common Cause, Wisconsin Democracy uh, uh, Campaign, Wisconsin Voices, 
um, obviously the Fair Elections Project. Thank you uh, for being a participant in those groups. I want to give special acknowledgement to Citizen Action for taking the lead in organizing tonight's town hall. I want to acknowledge Kristen Sutter yes. for all her leadership, Nancy Kaplan for all of her leadership, uh, and all the other folks from Citizen Action who are here. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that we have a lawsuit that we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. And at least one of the plaintiffs in the lawsuit is in the room. Uh, and she is a champion of the people, a citizen activist who's made a difference in every single part of her career. Please stand up, Helen Harris. Helen Harris is one of the plaintiffs. Are there any other plaintiffs in the room? Raise your hand if you're a plaintiff. There are 12 plaintiffs in the state. I can't see that well, so. Um, okay, thank you uh, very much. So let me just uh, give two more minutes of intro and then I'm gonna turn it over to Shante. Everybody knows that the political system is broken. There is no doubt about that. Republicans, independents, and Democrats, after the 2012 election, we found out and we analyzed just how broken the system was. Now, I have to get away from the mic, so sorry for those who are recording. Um, but I just want to show you this one chart that laid some groundwork. What we're going to talk about when we talk about gerrymandering is that there's a disconnection between how people vote and what happens in our elections uh, and how people, uh, how seats are allocated in the legislature. In 2010, the Republicans had a big win. They got a lot more votes, the red bar is higher, they got a lot more seats, 60 out of 99 seats in the state assembly. Then in 20, then they rigged the maps in 2011, right? And then in 2012, we had another election and the Democrats got a lot more votes. Remember, it was kind of crazy. Act 10 and cuts to education and 100,000 people marching in the streets. There was a reaction to that. Right? The Democrats got a lot more votes, but look, the number of seats in the assembly didn't change. Even though the Democrats had netted 430,000 marginal votes, the Republicans still came back with 60 out of 99 seats, a super majority in the state legislature. The system was broken. There was a disconnection. Now in 2014, the wave went back to the Republicans. They got more votes again. And then they got even more seats. Now this stayed pretty steady. The number of seats stayed pretty steady. But the elections go back and forth. Now, why this is important is that elections have to be meaningful. If elections aren't meaningful, our democracy doesn't work. We fought a war, few of them, one that started in 1775 or six, depending on how you look at it, about democracy being meaningful, people deciding for themselves. What those charts tell you is that people aren't deciding for themselves anymore, right? So that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. We're gonna to be talking about how citizens came together to do something about it. We wanna educate you about gerrymandering a little bit. We wanna talk about how things used to be different in Wisconsin and how we can make them better again through our collective action. Uh, and obviously we'll answer your questions. So that's the plan for the evening, okay? I'm really pleased then to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Shante Nelson is the program manager at Wisconsin Voices. She is a leader in multiple areas of fight democracy, many different ways. Uh, Shante helps to coordinate the efforts of progressive organizations statewide while helping, while working to build collective impact towards civic and voter engagement. Shante now. Right. Since we're dancing. Again, Shante Nelson, thank you all for being here. This is such a great turnout and we're going to jump right in to this presentation. What I will be talking to you about is fair election maps and fair maps and it's a bit the basics of gerrymandering 101. It is a setup to prepare us for where we will go tonight, go throughout the night, and it's fun and it's energetic, and I, what I want you all to do is lean in, we're all in this together, so let's all win together, okay? You all ready for that? Yeah. yeah. All right, so have you ever voted in Milwaukee? How many by a show of hands, if you will tell me, thank you, that you voted in Milwaukee. One of the things that, you, um, that we want you to think about is, where did you vote? Did you vote at a local library, a community center? Did you vote in a public building of some sort? So just be thinking about that. Where did you vote, right? And as we do this, what we want to do is we want to begin to talk about some of the things um, here. And we want to have some fun with this. So what we're going to do is we're going to vote. We're going to take some time and we're going to vote. We're going to take um, a vote on do we support the tweet or do we support the, the Snickers? Now, in order for us to understand this, we have to understand that we have two runner-up, two individuals, two pieces of candy who are running against each other, right? They're running the campaign against each other. They both stand 
for caramel and make milk chocolate. However, if you support the Snickers, then you also support that place of, um, of um, I can't think of what's in Snickers. <coughs> Thank you, peanuts, that's what it is. You support the peanuts, <laughs> okay? And if you support the, um, the Twix, then you support, of course, caramel as well as milk chocolate, but you also support the cookie bar. All right, so by a show of hands, who are supporters of Snickers? Just raise your hand. Snickers? Snickers. Snickers supporters. All right? All right, thank you. Can you get your hands down? <laughs> we sit up here and we say, ooh. Now this is phenomenal. Okay, so clearly there were more hands for the Snickers, correct? However, Twix wins. <laughs> Twix wins. However, although there were more votes for the Snickers, Twix is going to win. And you may say, well, that's unfair. And we may say, why didn't the candy with the most votes win? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. Gerrymandering or unfair voting math. We're going to talk about that today. It's going to be fun. It's going to be interactive. So we have an individual. There's a person with a pink tie. She's walking around and she's going to hand you out some candy. Thank you for participating. That's your treat for me. <laughs> Actually, your treat for citizen action. I won't take that right now. So, in order to find out why unfair voting happens in Wisconsin, we have to go back to where we go to vote. What information do you need? And you can, you can yell this out if you want. What information do you need to find out where you should vote? Is it your name? Is it your address? Or is it your driver's license? Say it loudly, please. Address. Thank you, address. Yes, but why? Why do we need our address? Because we live in a voting district. Voting districts are simply um, groups of individuals who are grouped together in one voting area on a map. Voting help the people within that group vote to choose who will speak for them in government, all right? So here's a voting district. You can see that this is a representation of a assembly district within the state of Wisconsin. And you can see that um, it's districts and each of the lines, uh, the red lines border a district. With this, you can also see that there are some funny shapes in these lines, correct? You, you all see what I see? Some of the lines are pretty funny. They're not equally drawn. They're not equal squares or equal rectangles or equal triangles. They're a little disconnected, right? So we want to talk about who speaks for you in government. Americans vote for two kinds of representatives or representation. We vote for senators and we vote for um, uh, or in the senators and representatives. For the purposes of this particular presentation, we're going to go right into honing in on how state level voting or unfair math will affect us in our everyday lived experience. So who speaks for you in government? In Wisconsin, we have 33 senators, and we have 99 representatives, all right? So let's imagine we live right here in the library, right here in Washington Park Library. Here's the library, and here's your home, right? So we live in three different voting districts at the same time in Wisconsin. You live here, you live in three different voting districts. You can click one more time. That's us at the library. You remember, that's Washington Park, it's right behind us. On the side of us, I should say, from where we are. We can vote for a state representative. That is the red line that borders this district here. Or we can vote for a state senator. That's that beige area that's represented there, that tan area, that's a voting district. Now, if we just take a little bit of a pause, I just wanna show you something. Because we have 99, rep um, 99 uh, representatives and three senators, you have three different districts that will be in one Senate district, three different representative districts that make up one Senate district, right? So with that, we can also vote on a national level. And if you live here in the library or within the city of Milwaukee, you live in a national district four, where those who represent district four on a national level, senators and representatives. So Really quickly, I'll show you what that means. So, your state representative, if you lived here, would be Representative Evan Goyke. If you lived here, your senator for the state would be Senator Latanya Johnson. On a national level, your national senator, which would be, or national representative, I apologize, would be Congresswoman Gwen Moore. 
And then your national representation for senators are Tammy Baldwin and Ron Johnson. All right, if you live here. So guess what, that's a lot of voting power. That's the reason why redistricting and gerrymandering is very important because we have a lot of voting power that we don't always think about, right? talk about it does not represent them or it's not a slight to them or any of that I just we just want to make a point so we, when we ask this question does your senators and your representatives care about the issues you care about it is not a slight to anyone we just showed so that's 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 my point <laughs> okay we are all in this together so you want lead out of your drinking waters your representative or your senator can fight in order to get you money to do that you want safe roads a grocery store or the creation of new jobs here we are again, your senator or your representative can fight to have roads fixed, to attract new businesses, and have good paying jobs, all right? So unfair voting maps can stop you from choosing a representative who cares about the issues that you care about. How, you may say, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Through a process called gerrymandering. So, remember those weirdly shaped lines that we had. We're gonna give us a little bit of a short video that explains it and breaks it down a little bit more. Pay attention to this one. Hope we have audio. <laughs> okay, let's, let's see if we can. No? No audio? Okay. And geometry. Every state is split into districts. You've got congressional districts where each district gets one rep in the U.S. House of Representatives. Every 10 years, states redraw the district lines to account for people moving and other population changes. There are two big rules. population, those, who, it, those communities that are most populated with um, communities of color, those who lean more towards a, a democratic um, vote, they were grouped into one district, which would be that Kenosha District 22. That's a prime example of gerrymandering right here within the state of Wisconsin. So we talked about redistricting and how it's a, a, vote, a drawing map. It, it's a map drawn, uh, drawn that shows they position us where the politicians choose who votes for them. And that's not what we're about. So what if the politician who chooses you to vote for them doesn't care about what it is that you care about? Gerrymandering goes around the will of the people in order to get a particular election result or outcome. So unfair voting maps, it gives one political party too much power. Democrats and Republicans have done it. They're supposed to balance each other, other's ideas in order to make sure that the best idea wins, but when one party gets too much power, there's no compromise between the sides and the most extreme ideas win. So, remember Act 10? How many remember that? Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Were we asking for our teachers to lose their union bargaining rights? Are we asking for that? Yeah. <laughs> no one says you said yes, right? Like, okay, so I thought I heard someone say yes. Remember right to work? Were we demanding weaker unions for workers? Remember the big cut to public education? Yeah. Were parents asking for this, right? However, we received them. They, those, these are examples that we were, it were examples of ways that we were impacted as community as it relates to gerrymandering or unfair voting maps. So we're gonna talk about three ways that politicians draw voting maps unfairly. We're gonna talk about the political, which are unfair voting maps to either side, where either side has too much power. 
We're going to talk about racial voting maps, voting maps that are unfair to people of color. And we're going to talk about prison voting maps, prison um, voting maps that are drawn unfairly to communities who have many of their members in prison. So here we are, politically unfair voting maps. Voting maps that can be drawn unfairly against either Republicans or Democrats. Remember, I say that both have they have been involved with Jim.
they rule in our favor, they will establish across the land, across America, that gerrymandering is unconstitutional, as a court said, a federal court said in Wisconsin. A federal court decision written in Wisconsin by a federal judge appointed by President Ronald Reagan wrote the decision. He's the one that said that our map is unconstitutional. I think that's just a terrific bit of progress, and we're, we're pretty, pretty excited about it. Um, another way of describing gerrymandering is that the elections are decided the day the map is drawn, not decided on election day. What does that mean? That means that the November election, the one that we all think matters, the one we all go out and have the biggest turnout for, is the big deal. Well, in the legislative districts, it is not a big deal because that election was decided. Uh, there's only, of the 99 assembly seats in Wisconsin, about eight or 10 are actually competitive out of 99. So what happens when the November election doesn't matter? There's only one other election that could matter. It's called primary. It's in August in Wisconsin. Beautiful time for a primary, small turnout. If you are in a safe district and your only concern is the primary, boy, stick with your party. You stick with them right down the line, and that's both parties. Because if you don't, if you're a Republican and you're not sticking with the team 100%, you will get a primary challenge from the political right. If you're a Democrat and you don't stick with the team, you'll get a primary challenge from the Democrat from the left. So stick with the team, do what you're told. So by all means, if you're a legislator in this environment today, don't get called a moderate. I mean, that is like a four letter word. <laughs> don't get called a compromiser. That will get you a primary. And the legislative leadership will find the primary opponent for you. And they'll fund that primary opponent for you. So what do you do? You stick with the team, you never work with anybody else on the other side, you never co-sponsor bills, you don't uh, work to try to find a common ground on an issue. And what happens? America, and Wisconsin, and across the country, everybody's going, why can't those folks ever get along? Why can't they work together? Why can't they get things done in the best interest of Wisconsin or the nation? Because if they do that, they get a primary and they get beat. And somehow people in elective office love to get reelected sort of a common thing that, that, that uh, <laughs> tends to run through the, the human body when you're in, in the legislature. So gerrymandering is, 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 is not only takes away the value of your vote because it's decided before you go to the polls in November, it's decided the day the map is drawn, it impacts overall our government and how our government doesn't work. It, this is a major, major factor, not only in the state legislature, in the Congress. 435 people in the House of Representatives, the estimates are about 35 to 40 of those 435 seats are actually competitive. The rest of them have been decided by the map drawers. So you wonder why the Congress doesn't do what you think they should do and why they won't work with everybody else? They don't want a primary either. That's just, uh, that's, that's the reality. When we talk about this issue three or four years ago, we find that um, uh, it wasn't visceral. They, 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 there was nothing about gerrymandering in the abstract that made them end health care or education or uh, a variety of environmental issues, etc. But when we would say to the crowd, did you know that the legislators in Madison, by their vote to pass that map, guaranteed themselves a job for the next 10 years? How many of you work at a place? unless you're the owner. How many of you work at a place that you, by your own own action, can guarantee that you will keep your job for the next 10 years? That's what they can do. That started to get a little reaction from the crowd when we, when we talked about it that way, but it was, it was the only really visceral way that we would um, we could really get, get to it. You can't separate this issue from money. I'm kind of going through the things fast because I, I want to hear from Dale, and we want to have your questions. So. Trust me, I don't want to leave at seven o'clock. We'll, we'll stay for questions as long as you as long as you have them. There's something else about this campaign money. The one thing that people who give money to campaigns love to do, they love to give to winners. It's a better investment, especially if you're giving a lot of money. 
what better system to have than this one? Yeah. You know who the winners are before the election's held. So you get to give money to the winners, so you can have influence that people are going to be in Madison, not give money to people who are not going to be in Madison. Now, people who are strongly partisan and feel that way will give money to people in both parties for sure. But the huge amounts of money that are really affecting our elections today, it's given to winners. And right now, they want to give all the money to the Republicans here. I'm sure they want to give all the money to the Democrats in Maryland. Uh, it just depends on which state did, did which. So we've got kind of a, a combination of problems in this, in this country and state. One, one might call the money, the money tocracy is what I call it. It's just this whole power of, of, of large sums of money, often not disclosed, and rigging elections, which is what we're here for tonight. So it's my hope, I, I'm sure it's all your hope, that we, we have a, the Supreme Court's going to hear the case on October 3rd. They'll make the decision in time to redraw the maps if we win by this 2018 election. There's still time if they decide in January. There's plenty of time to redraw the maps uh, to meet whatever direction we get from the Supreme Court. So um, I thank you all for coming here. This is a wonderful crowd. It's terrific to see all of you here. And I'm also very happy to, to be here with, with my friend Dale Schultz. Um, he, um, he and I are uh, kind of the odd couple. <laughs> we, uh, we go around the state together. Um, I, I tried to find a taller guy to go around with, but I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> state, rep, state Senator and former State Representative Dale Schultz, a terrific <laughs> person. You know, I want to say to all of you, it's really a great honor to be here. I see a few old faces that I've met before and, and an awful lot of new faces. And one of the things that I've always enjoyed about politics is the relationships that sort of got found along the way. My friend Fred Kessler, Spencer Cox, are people I, I never would have met or had the opportunity to work for and with uh, to make this state a, a better place. And it's meetings like this that made that all possible. So I, I want you to know it really is a, a great honor for me to be here. But you know, tonight isn't about me. It's not about me and Tim or Sanchin or, or Shante. Really, it's about you. It's about us. And it's about what we believe in as Americans ought to be the way our government conducts its business. I think all of us believe that our vote is the most important thing we have in this democracy, that it has value, and every uh, vote counts uh, the same and is precious. And it gives us, as Shante said, uh, power to change things. Well, what this lawsuit is about, and, and I think it's important uh, for us to continue to communicate, is the value of everybody's vote being equal. If somebody has the power to draw you into a district where you really don't or can't really be valuing your vote, and that's not right. I think we all know that. We wouldn't want it to happen to us. And, and you know, for heaven's sakes, if the other side's doing it, does it make it okay for us to do it? We don't tell our children uh, those kinds of, of lessons as they grow up? No. Right is right. And you do what's right. And I think that all of us share something else. We're worried. We're worried about the body politic. Everywhere Tim and I have gone around the state of Wisconsin, we've heard it over and over and over again from ordinary citizens who suddenly have been jarred by one thing or another into action. And they say, we're really worried about our government and, and how polarized our society has become and how unfair things seem. And, and we really want to make a change. And my comment back to them is, look, don't let the size of this overwhelm you. Pick a target, stay involved, and help make a difference. And for some of us, we've been doing this for just about four years. Some are a little newer. But along the way, we've learned from each other. Uh, we've gotten a little smarter about how we go after things. There have been people trying to be dismissive of us from day one. They'd say things like, well, the, the public really doesn't care. Nobody ever mentions this. Uh, you know, the, as Tim said, but the other side always does it. Through educational efforts like Shantae's here tonight and the things that Sancha has talked about, 
more and more people are starting to understand, at least in part, what's wrong uh, with the process and why the body politic is ailing to some degree. We're now getting very close to the time when a decision is going to be made. And I think that uh, a long time ago I learned that the Supreme Court isn't final because it's right. I learned that it's right because it's final. And, uh, and, and you know, these are people who do the best they can to apply the law, uh, to fill in the gaps between when things are silent. And, and at the same time, they represent America, and I'd like
units of government are stepping forward, passing resolutions because they hear the citizenry. As more and more uh, legislators and politicians are contacted personally by letter or email or what have you, they will get the message. When it becomes popular, trust me, they'll be beating a path to get in front of the, tr uh, of the parade uh, to help pass it. But until that time, we have to continue to educate and advocate on behalf of change. And I just want to point something out to you. You know, this isn't a, a democratic plot. You know, the Iowa model was passed by a Republican governor, Robert Ray, and two Republican-controlled houses of the Iowa legislature. And in 40 years, nobody in either political party has ever had the courage to put in a bill to change it because the people love it and they know the system is fair and I would submit to you in Iowa there's much greater satisfaction and confidence in government than there is in the state of Wisconsin as a loyal badger that bothers me to no end. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me say one other thing. I think the thing about local, you know, we, we have a campaign going, Citizen Action and Wisconsin Democracy right. Campaign and others are fighting for these county resolutions, I think I mentioned them earlier, um, and, and those are passing in Trump County. Right? Those are passing with very conservative local legislators saying we want the political system to work again so that government is responsive to us. Uh, we have a plaintiff, Wendy Sue Johnson, who talks a lot about how in the Eau Claire area, and she used to be on the school board in Eau Claire, for decades, party members, Republicans and Democrats would come together, school board members, legislators, and they'd work together on a quarterly basis to talk about what's happening in the legislature, what's happening in the schools. And after gerrymandering was put into effect, the Republican legislators around Eau Claire suddenly thought, well, we don't need to come to these anymore because our seats are safe and we don't need to engage anymore. And it's changed the character of how people engage. And so even Republicans locally in Eau Claire are like, we don't like that this system has changed, that we used to have these conversations and this cooperation. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is our national partners, the Campaign Legal Center, is taking the lead on, on, on arguing the case at the, at the, at the court and help uh, tremendously at the trial, help organize the case. Um, and uh, our partners in the National Fair Maps Coalition, of which Fair Elections Project is a, is a participant, released a poll this week. Um, there was a bipartisan poll with a Democratic pollster and a Republican pollster that showed that this issue is now becoming resonant to voters. It's something that Republican, Independent, and Democratic voters all care about, but huge majorities agree that we need to end gerrymandering, that we need to end map rigging, that we need to make the process independent, that politicians shouldn't be drawing their own maps. And that's because of energy, right? That's because of citizen energy. We think the case catalyzed that, right? And, and the fight for the bills and the county resolutions are catalyzing that. And we're filling rooms, right? We had a room in Wauwatosa a few weeks, uh, or at the, at the end of the spring. We had 175 people. The fire marshal said we couldn't let any more people in the room to talk about gerrymandering in the town hall. I mean, it's an astonishing development, right? There are thousands of people who've watched our live streams at, you know, from, from this town hall and from the town hall in Green Bay and Appleton and places all over the state. So we're building that energy. Uh, we have uh, an incumbent Republican congressman, Mike Gallagher, who's spoken up and said, this has got to change. We've got you know, a guy who's likely to run for president again, John Kasich, as a Republican, probably going to challenge Trump, who's talking about how this has to change. So there is an in increasing amount of energy in the Republican Party, um, and I think that that can be combined with the citizen energy to make a difference. So I hope that answers uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, John McCain. John McCain. Bob Sen Cole. Senator uh, Blake. There are a lot of Republicans who don't see this as a partisan issue and really care about this country. And I think it's important that we r remind people that even though the vehicle here is one gerrymander in the country, the goal here is to make it fair for everyone, regardless of their beliefs across the country. Now, I have to take a little moment here and do a shameless political shameless plug. plug. It's shameless not free plug. when you come here. <laughs> uh, my good friend, uh, Tim Cullen, wrote a book. And he has them for sale here, they're $20, and he doesn't make Shame. a nickel, not even a nickel off of every one of these. I know many of you have these books, uh, but it's sort of his uh, reflection on his uh, life in politics from the 70s on, and explains a lot of what's going on and why. Every nickel of, of, of the sale of every one of these books goes to a project in Janesville to support students of color to get a degree in education and come back to Janesville and make the teacher corps more accurately reflect the student body. It's a wonderful cause, and he's a great guy, and I'm honored to have 
had the opportunity to sort of read the chapters along with a number of other people to check it for accuracy. <laughs> it's a great read, you'll, you'll really enjoy it. And I've just taken it upon myself at every single one of these meetings to, to do this. So I please ask your forgiveness. It's a great read and, and please stop and talk to him about it afterward. And I know he'd be happy to sign at least 100. So we're gonna take a few more questions. If you need to make your escape, please feel free. Don't forget to fill out your card and turn it in. Uh, and we'll take three or four more questions and then we'll stick around and have a little bit more. Yes, Is there a place that pe we can refer people to to see a presentation like this? Like you said, it was on Facebook Live. Yeah. I'm not astute enough in technology to know if then I right. could watch it later. Right. So uh, we Thank you. Or, which is on the fact sheet. Uh, you can also search for Sins in Action Cooperative yeah. on Facebook. Yeah. You'll find the Walking Cooperative and you'll find the live feeds there. Okay. And then they Thanks. get reposted in a bunch of different places. On yeah. one of the handouts, there's a link to where you can go to watch it after. There's a link on one of the handouts. Yes. Too. Yes. It's a white awesome. sheet. I think it has a thing about overflow rooms on it. Definitely a couple more. Yeah. There. Yes, ma'am. So the point that really resonates with me about uh, the presentation tonight was that um, Republicans won 48% of the popular vote in 2012, I believe you said, and they got 60% of the assembly seats. That to me is undemocratic. And I know that the state of Wisconsin is, uh, is uh, appealing the Supreme Court decision. So our taxpayer dollars are going to be spent. That Millions. Millions of taxpayer dollars. So I would like to We won in 2014, so it doesn't matter what happened in 2012. Kind of forgetting that like things happen over time, right? So had the 2012 election manifested the way that voters actually voted, then things might have gone differently after that, right? But he kind of says, well, so what happened in 2014 is lots of people didn't run. Lots of people didn't vote. They said, it doesn't matter, right? We got more votes, we had great candidates, they did all kinds of stuff, and it didn't matter, why should we keep trying? So yeah, the Republicans won in 2014. They won a much narrower victory in 2016, but they actually got even more seats. So they keep winning by lots and getting more. So that disconnection has a has a, uh, a, a a subduing effect on democracy, right? And and are there talking points? Sure, the people who benefit from this because they maintain power, the Senate Majority Leader, the Speaker of the Assembly, the Governor, they don't they don't have any shame about about uh, fighting for it and saying this is how it should be, and they're spending. Millions of dollars defending it, and that's what they're doing. Yes, ma'am, in the red shirt here. Uh, this question is for Shantae, but all of you, I'm absolutely alarmed at the comment about the um, prison gerrymandering. And I'm thinking about Fox, um, Fox Lake, Waupon, uh, Black River Falls, Chippewa Falls, all around the state getting funds at 53126 is absolutely devastated in terms of the community. That seems to be an issue other than gerrymandering in addition to being a gerrymandering issue. How do we deal with that policy issue? What, I'm, I'm not even sure how to phrase the question, but that seems to be a significant policy issue that needs to be addressed separately from gerrymandering. Am I right about that? You, um, uh, yes, you are right about that to answer your question. In addition to that, that is my reason and that is the um, intent is to, uh, to do exactly what happened with you, to alarm people. A lot of times people are not aware of prison gerrymandering. 
and people are not always um, educated about it. So my intent and my purpose is to go around the state, around the nation if I have to, and really begin to educate people about prison gerrymandering and how it affects communities that have people who are in prison. Because when, like I stated, when they're released from prison, they're released back into their community uh, from which they were arrested, not within the community that they are. So would it be lovely to look and say, hey, let's begin to initiate a policy that says, well, when they're released from prison, we release them into the, into the area that they got counted in? That would be great. But these are things that we're absolutely, we're deep, this is something that is so new and it's so, uh, so many people are unaware of this with especially within communities of color, right now what I'm trying to do is educate and expose. Educate and expose. That's the entire intent of my presentation, to try to make sure that people understand that it happened. And then from that, then we can begin to move, have put some movement with that to say, let's do something. Is Micah doing anything about that? Micah is doing some work. Um, of, uh, yes, some work um, as well as Expo. They're doing some work as well, um, which is ex-prisoners organizing. They're doing some work um, statewide as well. So there are groups who are actually doing some work as it relates to prison and imprisonment of people of color or communities of color. So I want to give Fred a chance to say something here, and then we're going to take one more question, and then I we're going to- I should probably have respond to that. I offered a constitutional amendment uh, that basically said uh, for census purposes, it's because the, the reason we have the constitutional amendment is that we know that if the Republicans got the majority the way they did in 210, any statute would just immediately be repealed and we'd be returning to the same situation that we have. But a constitutional amendment requires voter approval and you can't change that without bringing it back to the voters. So I've always been one who says we have to do this. But this is going to be a very, very difficult question because it's, I, I'm not sure that the voters in rural Wisconsin will vote to increase the representation of people from Milwaukee if we, if we count them back, then, back in their district where they originally came from. My view had been they shouldn't be counted at all. Because that way we can probably win a constitutional amendment without having the issue of the increasing Milwaukee or Racine's representation. So that's a hard one to sell. Uh, and I know some of my friends, when I offered that, said, well, Fred, we, we're, we're uncomfortable with that. But I wanted to make sure that we got a constitutional amendment that couldn't be overturned when it went to the voters of the people. Because even in Wapan, there are people who are a little pissed off that the aldermanic district with the prison has more people and, the least, and it has the equal representation. And so therefore, uh, there's some uh, uh, wards in, in, in places like Wapan and Fox Lake that, uh, that basically end up having over-representation uh, because they're, uh, they have the prisons located in this. So we think we could win on a referendum if we dealt with that in the way that, uh, that I did. And I have a lot of people, once I explained it, I think I had a lot of support for that. But when the Republicans took control, the, I, I had a hearing on that, uh, but uh, we, uh, we never got uh, uh, any uh, uh, traction. We're going to take one, thank you Fred, we're going to take one more question and then we're going to, we'll stick around and happy okay. to talk to folks one-on-one. -on -one. So for anyone who's an expert on the case, if we get a favorable decision and the Supreme Court decides that the, today's Wisconsin map is unconstitutional, yeah. what is your level of confidence that we will have new maps in place for next November's election? Because I've heard some people right. say, oh, there are delaying tactics, they'll stall, they'll make it not happen. So I'll, I'll give you my view okay. as, and, and I I think I can fairly consider myself an expert yeah. on the case. So let's make some assumptions. There's going to be an argument in October. Let's assume we get a decision by January or early February at the latest. What we would expect to happen, based on what we've seen in other types of gerrymandering cases, racial gerrymandering cases, et cetera, is that the court will assign the legislature, again, the responsibility of drawing a new map, but they will give them very little time. 
That could be two weeks, four weeks, six weeks. I would be surprised if it were more than six weeks at that point. The legislature then would either pass a new map or they wouldn't pass a new map, okay? So that's the divergence. If they don't pass a new map, we'll come back to that in a second. If they do pass a new map, the district court will vet that map and they will determine whether it meets the standard that they set and that the Supreme Court sets. It is very unlikely, it is possible, but it is very unlikely that whatever decision the district court makes would be appealable to the Supreme Court. They might try, but what is likely is the Supreme Court would say, nope, this is an implementation issue, the district court can handle it, we're not gonna review that, and the district court will make an up or down decision on the map, and we'll go forward. The map won't be perfect if the legislature passes it. It won't be fair, it will be fairer than it'll the current map. It'll be less bad, It'll at be least. less bad, and there'll be a chance for the minority party to pick up a number of seats in the 2018 election. That map would be implemented then by February, March, April at the worst, and you know they might even adjust the primary, the, the signature schedule, but it would get us to a November election in a reasonable time. If they don't pass a map, then the court will impose a map. And that happens all over the country all the time. There's a lot of different processes they can use to develop a map. They can take submissions, they can appoint a master, they can just pick a map and say this is the map. There's all kinds of different things they can do. That map, again, would be in that same time frame, March, April, you know, under that scenario. So at this point, knowing that we have argument the second day of term, right, which is October 3rd, we have a lot of confidence that if we get a good decision, we'll get a good new map, a better map, for November 2018. And that's why we're fighting. Thanks to all of you for being here. Join us in action, take action, uh, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank Oh, I will get your Thank you, guys. Maybe, I don't know.